Okay, first, uh, thank you for agreeing to the interview. It's an honor to have you at the Shanghai Forum 2017. Thank so, you Korea much. Foundation, welcome. For Advanced Studies, like KFAS, as you saw this morning, mm -hmm. has co-hosted this Shanghai Forum with Fudan University yes. since 2005, so this is the 13th forum. So KFAS is a non-profit organization that provides scholarship programs, academic exchange and support programs, and also research funding mm -hmm. to institutions in Asia, including, of course, China. Yes, it's here. a famous organization. Yeah, it is the, yes. the most famous in Korea. So this interview will be shared with all of our fellows and partners in various countries. So let me start with the first Very question. Good, yeah. You won the 2010 Nobel Prize for your work in the economics of unemployment, mm -hmm. especially using the data of job flows in and yes. outs and the effects of being unemployed. Mm -hmm. What personally motivated you to start this lifelong research on labor markets? Mm -hmm. And what do you hope that others see as your legacy in economics? Well, the, the, the personal motivation is something that uh, occurs a lot of people um, when they haven't studied e e economics in detail, say, to understand the economy, where they say, how could a booming economy, one that is growing fast, one that is producing so many things, still have a fraction of the labor force, which could be anything between 5 and 10 percent in normal times, that do not have jobs, they do not have income. And, and unemployment is a um, cause for unhappiness, now that we know a little bit more about uh, statistics. It's one of the two or three, you know, the sort of death, divorce, unemployment are the main ones. So I right. thought, uh, what is causing this, uh, this problem? And why does it uh, fluctuate like that? When I was doing my graduate study in London, uh, unemployment yeah. started going up. It was the first time that unemployment so was, that was going around up. When? Uh, around the in er early 1970s, when oh. we had the first oil shocks sure. and then the unemployment okay. going up. And recession at the time. Yes, and, uh, and then I thought, let's try to understand it. The, you know, what, what does economics have to teach us about this mm. uh, very big problem? I looked at the uh, theories of unemployment of the time. They were mainly associated with the work of uh, John Maynard Keynes, mm -hmm. whom I admire enormously as an economist, of course, like so many other people. But the, his theories couldn't quite explain what was happening at that time. Why was unemployment going up? Why it was not responding to government policy? So I thought it obviously needs a fundamental rethinking. Mm -hmm. And I started that with my PhD thesis in the way that PhD students do it, yes. in a sort of clumsy way, taking <laughs> everything into account, hoping that you're going to hit the best. Well, in the end, you know, I mean, I criticize it because I look back after so many years, but it, it was a successful PhD thesis. It's still circulating as a book, in fact. Mm -hmm. oh. um, and uh, little by little, uh, I've been improving it, mm -hmm. stripping it down to the essential um, contributions and then realized about 10 years later maybe came up with a um, view of unemployment that was workable in that it, it could incorporate all the main influences that we're thinking about unemployment like uh, this incentive effects that uh, workers have when they receive unemployment benefit uh, why productivity shocks of the kind we observed in the 1970s influence it, um, why the old Keynesian factors are still there. And that's what I would like my legacy in the profession to be. In fact, this, uh, this idea that the, the introducing one or two apparently small extensions yeah. suddenly open up a new research area, right. which, is, uh, bring, which brings in all these factors. And which currently, in fact, they are helping governments design um, good unemployment policy uh, to avoid long term unemployment, to speed up the uh, re employment of, of workers. Right. So, okay, I'll go come back to your kind of motivation mm -hmm. later. But these days, like unemployment rates in some developed countries like UK, US, and France mm -hmm. have hit record lows. Mm -hmm. But in UK, The Guardian recently reported that. British people are actually feeling worse off mm. because wages has increased. In the US, Bloomberg Business Week also described this as reporting that the US economy is behaving mysteriously. Mm. So some commentators even depict this recovery from the Great Recession as job field non-recovery, maybe to compare against the uh, jobless recovery in the mm. early 2000s. Mm. So what do you think are some possible explanation to this mysterious situation? Um, a lot in the uh, recent recovery is um, 
it has to do with um, the new technology that we introduced at the same time. This morning. Uh, like the lecture I gave this morning, in that uh, new technologies are based on the internet, on artificial intelligence, computerization, and um, this technology benefits high skilled workers because they are the ones that uh, are complementary to them. They can use computers in their work to increase their productivity. So unless you have a mechanism by which the gains from productivity from the computer users can be distributed more evenly across the labor uh, force, you're going to get the, the things we have been observing in the United States and uh, elsewhere. Um, now, some countries have succeeded in uh, introducing such mechanisms. You know, Sweden, Norway, Denmark have the countries that have done it most. Other Northern European countries have done it. Other countries deliberately failed to introduce such mechanisms, which is the United States, UK United France. Kingdom. Uh, yeah, France has tried, but not very well. And maybe now, with the uh, new regime, uh, there is some hope that they will do it, because the new president has said that he will deal with this problem. But we'll have to wait and see. Um, unfortunately, it's not one um, area where the European Union has taken the initiative, although they could have done, and I was hoping that they should, to g give some solidarity within uh, Europe and the Eurozone. Instead, the problems of the Eurozone have been addressed one at a time, ignoring this issue of unemployment and uh, in inequality. Now, the, when you look at the unemployment figure, the uh, United States figure looks like it's very good, but in fact, if you go behind the figure, you'll find that there are a lot of prime age men without a job mm -hmm. uh, who are not being listed as unemployed. And if you bring those men into the labor force as unemployed, then the unemployment figure is not going to look good. Um, all those people, there are a number of factors that contribute to the non-employment of those people. Um, you know, obviously, having served a prison sentence, uh, drug abuse, even though you have recovered, it, it doesn't enable you to go straight back into the labor force. There might be discrimination against you, even if you try it. You may have lost the work ethic and need something more than just uh, recovery or having served your sentence. You will need a, a, a training program. You will need some guided assistance in the labor market, which is not uh, being offered in the United States. Uh, the other uh, factor might be that people get uh, disillusioned with the labor market and the options they have once they lose a job and they drop out completely. Right. And um, they're simply wasting their, their time. They're sitting in front of the TV. They sleep long hours and, right. and it's gone. And those, like yeah, yeah, and those should be counted uh, really as non-employed stroke unemployed. In the UK, we don't have this problem, although unemployment is very low. The, other, the feature of the UK, though, is that a lot of the uh, jobs uh, are what are called uh, zero, zero hour uh, contracts job, or, the, or what they call the gig economy, which is that they are not regular full time jobs that people wanted when they were looking for work that would lead to um, a, a, a career, mm -hmm. and that they are jobs that are taken temporarily, they have high turnover and that. Now, e my view, like that I guess of any sensible person, if you mm -hmm. ask them, is that a regular full-time permanent job is preferable sure, to this. Sure. But my view is, is also that if the alternative is unemployment, it's better to have one of these jobs than not having right. one at all. So it, it depends where you draw the line, but the picture is not as rosy as it, as it looks. And uh, I do expect it, unfortunately, to get worse now as the uncertainties of Brexit will start hitting the labor market. Right. So you mentioned like going behind the figures. So let me ask mm -hmm. one of the questions. So globally, like chronic youth unemployment is a huge challenge for both policymakers and business leaders and academics as mm -hmm. well. So the failure to give young people jobs the, is a kind of worrisome element of social instability in addition to unemployment itself, the figure itself. So experts have warned that we now have a scarred or new last generation in world mm -hmm. economy. So what do you, th do you think there is an effective solution to systematically decrease youth unemployment rates? Well, first I have to say that with the exception of uh, countries like Greece, 
uh, and to some extent Spain, that are high unemployment countries. I, I don't think there is a lost uh, generation of, uh, because of youth unemployment in uh, the countries of Northern Europe, North America, uh, or the, uh, the fast-growing Asian countries, including, of course, Korea, Korea and China. Um, youth unemployment is always higher than adult unemployment. Right, right. Across the OECD, youth unemployment is about twice as high as uh, adult unemployment. And there are very good reasons for that. It is that uh, young people have not quite found their niche in the labor market yet. They are looking, they are job shopping, uh, they are seeing what career they like best. They've just come out of school, they don't have the experience in job search. They um, are starting from the beginning. And to some extent it's advantageous to have uh, higher youth unemployment on the assumption that the young unemployed are exploring their options in the labor market. Um, we all know young people who've just come out of uh, university or school, for example, and who say, and if you ask them, you know, what are you doing about the job? They say, oh, I've applied to a number, mainly rejections. I have one or two options, but I'm considering them. I'm thinking whether I should reapply. That's a very, very correct, logical right. way of going about the labor market. It's like optimal friction. Exactly. It's how you deal with the frictions and the information imperfections of the labor market when you are a young person and how you are dealing with an older person. When you when you are with it, when you are a young person, the uh, state of unemployment is not as um, objectionable when you are collecting that information as it is if you are in your thirties or forties with a family and so on. Um, now. It, it's very difficult to measure how much that uh, additional unemployment should be. Mm -hmm. um, in I mean, my view with the statistics without having any very accurate measurement, because it's not possible to do one with, the, with what we know now, uh, something like up to two, uh, up to twice as high youth than, mm -hmm. than adult, it, it doesn't sound too crazy. <laughs> you know, it, okay. Now, the question though is, is what, at what level overall unemployment a country is working? Right, if right. a country is functioning around 5% unemployment and you have 10% youth unemployment, mm -hmm. I, I don't think that's a problem. Yes. There is nothing like a lost unemployment, but lost the generation. But if a country is working at something like 10 to 15% unemployment and then youth unemployment is 30%, then you really get into, uh, in, into problems and, and you need government mm -hmm. intervention in the youth labor market. So you think the Greece and Spain is more than twice the one? I'll check about the Korean data and then to see if it passes your yeah. test or not. Well, it, well in, uh, you see, like Greece would have something like 25% adult right. unemployment and 50% youth unemployment. Well, right. then that means half of the young people are right. out of work and, and without much hope of getting in. Then you, then you do need desperately youth un uh, measures. Right. And also, you have, turning to a different topic, you have expressed your support for the idea of the universal basic income, as mentioned this mm -hmm. morning. So Switzerland, however, recently proposed a monthly basic income of 2,500 Swiss francs, about 16 or 1,700 US dollars for adults, and 625 francs for children, which led to a referendum, but say 77% of its citizens voted mm -hmm. against the proposal. So could you talk a little bit about your reasons for advocating the universal basic income and about your explanations for the Swiss voting out the proposal? Well, the, the, the idea of universal basic income is that um, instead of looking at um, individual cases and people's individual needs, whether they're un unemployed, what assets they have, what they don't have, you follow a social policy which ensures that um, everyone is above the poverty line. Right. Um, then you obviously have to finance that out of uh, taxation mm -hmm. yes. because it's an ongoing situation. It's not a one-off during a cyclical downturn or anything like that. Then you um, have to make sure that it's not being taken advantage of with uh, people or couples or families sitting back and saying, uh, this income is enough for me to keep going, mm -hmm. so why should I bother with work? So you have, to, you have to structure it in a way where, where there are sanctions, right. but the principle is there. But if 
you have found that you are abusing the principle, then you are sanctioned and maybe it's taken away from you or, or is reduced in the first instance and then uh, taken away. We know enough, and, and in fact, this is where when you ask me about what legacy would I leave, I would, I would like to think that the model of unemployment we developed and the model of incentives in the labor market uh, gives you a nice framework to calculate what the disincentive effects are from that policy. And you can calculate and you can decide your sanctions, which would be a political decision. But the main issue um, I wanted to address with that when I said I was in favor was that you don't look at individual cases and interview them and question them and, and, and make them feel bad about claiming as it were or, or, or having, leaving things at the discretion of uh, officers and how much they give. Them. You have a universal policy that is understood by everyone and uh, so on and, and, and so forth. Now, why do people reject it? Well, most of the voters in any country are those who will never have need for universal income, but they will have to pay taxes to finance it. <laughs> and, okay. and unfortunately, so how, how well-meaning people are when it comes to voting, nice. your, your own income, you, you do vote, mm -hmm. you, you're voting something that will cost you money. Mm -hmm. You do vote in the way that uh, will benefit you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I see, that's a matter of how to design and <coughs> to whom. Yeah. Okay. So turning to the U.S., maybe we watched BBC in the hotel while it's more of CNN. So the Trump-Russia scandal has had an immediate impact on the U.S. economy. The U.S. dollar drop, stock market sort of crashed, and mounting political difficulties are raising doubts about the ability to push through the proposed tax cuts and infrastructure spending. So there are a few serious mainstream economists among President Trump's economic advisors. How concerned should we be about his economic policy agenda and how profoundly will it affect the U.S. and the world, including U.K., financial markets? Well, I, I think we should be very concerned about his uh, economic agenda because, it, it, I mean, you know, to put it bluntly, it's a, it's a shambles. It's looking at one thing at a time and uh, doing one thing there, one thing here, one thing there. There is no... Um, consistent, coherent policy for the overall, how do you approach the overall economy in the United States, uh, your relations with uh, f foreign countries, you know, then looks at, uh, at the Trans-Pacific Partnership. No, we're going to withdraw from that, he's saying. Look at, looks at the Atlantic first, he said he would withdraw, right. I think, if it's all right, and then he didn't. Um, looks at uh, China first, he makes hostile statements, then friendly ones. Right, suddenly. <laughs> yeah, Russia, he has no relation with Russia, then maybe he has, but not so what. Mm -hmm. it, we, we just don't know, and financial markets don't know where, where they stand. So when we were saying before the election that there would be a lot of uncertainty when he's elected, there was hope that he would have a program that he would follow, and you would have economic advisors who would... Um, point out this program but, uh, it, it, and make it sort of self-contained uh, and, 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 and coherent. But in fact, I, I doubt very much whether he even talks to his economic advisors when uh, suddenly <laughs> comes right. to his head to say something about the economy. And it's not surprising that financial markets are responding in the way that they are with volatility. Yeah, he talked to Michael Flynn about exchange rates, so that tells a lot. Yeah. So, so turning to Europe, so the process of Brexit has taken place with a bit more certainty. And France has just elected its new president, both of which experts say has helped deliver a further boost to already high conf consumer confidence in the Eurozone. Mm. So what do you think Emmanuel Macron means for Brexit and the European Union? And do you see Brexit and the victory of Macron as opportunities to reform Europe? Mm. Well, it's interesting that the two events happened in the same year because right. One, one is the, one of the worst things that could happen to, uh, Europe, to, to the uh, European Union mm -hmm. project as a whole, which is Britain leaving, you know, one of the right, right. biggest economies. And the other one was one of the best things that happened to it, mm -hmm. that the most pro-European, uh, pro-Eurozone um, president was elected in France. Traditionally, European Union was driven by a Franco-German alliance. Mm -hmm. uh, under um, Hollande, France basically withdrew from that uh, alliance and left everything in the hands of uh, the Germans and mm -hmm. Merkel and right. Schreiber, her finance minister in particular. I don't think they've been good for Europe. I mean, they, what they will say in defense is that uh, they managed to um, 
uh, steer Europe through this crisis and still a, a united Europe, but it, it, it's not a united Europe the way it was before the, the uh, crisis started and yes. when it, it had both France and Germany ahead uh, on, on uh, guiding it. So um, Macron's election, given what he said in his campaign, given what he did when he was um, a minister uh, before, yeah, it, it, it's very encouraging and, and especially with the uh, southern countries that um, have many of the problems that France has right. and hopefully Europe in the Eurozone will not have to go through a completely German-led and German-resigned policy. We had uh, this morning a lecture uh, about so Europe and, uh, yeah. and, and Greece and, and that, you know, structural reforms, of course, Europe needs it, like China and every other country. Right. But it was pointed out that, uh, very correctly in my view, that the policies followed in the Eurozone, which were essentially the policies um, designed and promoted by the German finance ministry right. have not been good for uh, Greece for or, uh, or, or Spain or other countries. Mm -hmm. there. You know, the Spanish economy is growing and you might say, look at uh, how well it's doing now. Uh, but wait a minute, it's now 2017. Right. The, what about the previous <laughs> five years? Yes. You know, it's <laughs> so, uh, so I am optimistic that um, Britain, no, I'm optimistic that the Eurozone will go well, with Macron in, in France and uh, whoever gets elected in uh, Germany. Now, of course, um, the, um, the social uh, democrats are likely to be much more pro-European with the uh, personnel they have now <laughs> um, in, in charge, but uh, with uh, Ma even Macron and Merkel, we sh should be doing a lot better than that. That's what um, I expect to see on the Brexit side. I, I, I don't really expect it, but I am hoping that Britain will stay as close to the European Union as possible after Brexit. So let's talk about my country for a second. Mm -hmm. So South Korea has also just elected its new president. The newly elected president, Mr. Moon Jae-in, has vowed to create a 110,000 new jobs in the public sector and reduce the number of contract workers like UK gig workers. Yeah. yeah. So who doesn't have the benefits? To zero at the public institutions at least. So what do you think are some opportunities and challenges in this policy of uh, transforming gig jobs to the regular jobs? Mm -hmm. What are your advices? Well, well, you see, when it comes to, uh, the, to the public sector, the situation is, is different. For, for the public sector, I do support it, in fact, to, even if it's a fewer number of jobs, mm -hmm. that um, companies that get funding from public sector should, it should involve some training as well and, and full-time jobs and, and, and career jobs so that people either stay in the public sector and pursue a career there, or even when they move outside, they move outside with some additional knowledge, not with a few years experience behind them where they work an odd number of hours every now and then according to the needs of the company. Um, now that may not be the way that had the company being private uh, behave, but I, I wouldn't object to using say tax revenue to subsidize the training on would the job training. Would I, I, would I would not object to use it. Okay. If, if they're public sector public uh, public uh, public companies. Public. In fact, even for private sector companies, I would not, but it's more, it's more difficult to design it for the private sector because I you see. have to make sure that it's not being taken right, advantage right. of. Um, now, I know without knowing um, too much about the policy of the uh, new administration in Korea, I have come across before this idea that, that the government will create so many jobs and will right. be judged on whether it created that job that number of jobs. I, I think that's the wrong approach to um, the labor market by the government. Okay. The government should be saying, we're going to create the right conditions for job creation in our economy, and we're going to encourage the, um, the market economy, private enterprises to create good, proper full-time jobs involving uh, career, good career prospects and training, rather than gig economy type jobs, but they should create the framework for doing that, not that they will create themselves. Because South Korea has 
achieve tremendous things and those things were achieved by the private sector, not by the public sector. So look back at what brought you success and continue along those lines. I see. So subsidize to build the right structure rather than to create jobs itself. Yes. So how exactly. they could be combined is, of course, the, the ideal yes. case. But OK, you're, yeah, yes. that, I buy that build the right structure or in, yeah, is, is a better than just jobs yes. itself. And I talk to someone whose views are not uh, pro-market in the Trump or even, mm -hmm. uh, or even the market in Thatcher sense. I'm right, talking right. to someone who supports universal <laughs> income and good social policies at the same time. But I believe that when it comes to job creation mm -hmm. and moving on to the future in our decentralized economies like uh, South Korea and, uh, okay. and, and the ones we have in Western Europe, okay. it's the private sector okay. that should be the driving force. So before I close the interview, let me ask the following question since many of the readers of the interview would be an economist. So your research on the labor market dynamics has been done through an angle of search and matching. Mm -hmm. Other area where search theory is popular is the theory of money. Yes. So Neil Wallace is in Korea like last week. So what do you think is common between the two goods, labor and money, that ask for a microphone theory of search and matching? Well, it's the, it's the information. It's basically down to how much information you have about the transaction. Uh, in, the, in labor markets, the information you don't have is the quality of the person as a, as a worker. And because, it, because your labor is embodied in you and you spend most of your working day mm -hmm. at, at the place of work, your personality and your character affects your productivity as well as your training. Just showing a certificate of training is, is not enough. And the reason there is search and matching is basically looking for that type of worker and looking for that type of job that can um, fit in well with you, can match. Mm -hmm. That's why it's called matching and, and, and be productive. And, and there's a lot of imperfect information involved and the search is revealing the imperfect information. In finance, the imperfect information is about, if it's about financing a project, then it's about the qualities of the project, you know, the prospects and all that. Mm -hmm. It's about different views that different people have about uh, the, the, financi the, the financial product mm -hmm. and, and views do differ. So once again, if, if you have need for some um, uh, finance, for some money to fund something, you have to search and persuade those who are providing it to give it to you at least cost because you persuade them that the information that you're giving them about that mm -hmm. project is the best one that there is. So it's, it's a very, very similar search mechanism, but one is your own character. The other one is the nature of your project. Goods, exchange, yeah. money. Yeah. Okay. okay. So the last question. So would you like to send a brief message to Shanghai Firm's audience? If you looking at the camera. Yes, I'm very pleased to be here in uh, Shanghai with you. I hope you have a very productive uh, couple of days. You have very good speakers on the program from what I have seen, very good discussions. and. Um, Forums of this kind are essential in exchanging ideas, in bringing people from different countries, different cultures, different types of economies together so that we can see best practice and apply it in our own economies. economies. So we're coming here with an open mind right. and hopefully everyone is here with an open mind and, uh, and, and we live here wiser than when they arrived. Okay. Thank you.